Carter from Griffin Jardine. He's going to talk to us about another interesting topic, uh, and hopefully we'll learn something about sudden onset strabismus, basically when you worry. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. The, um, good morning, everybody. I thought, uh, I, I thought this was always a challenge as a resident. I think you see a lot of acute onset diplopia and strabismus, and what, when is it uh, neurologic? When is it non-neurologic? Are there ways to differentiate? Um, I've made a little uh, reference to Hamlet's soliloquy here, and I think it's, I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's one of the most famous soliloquies in all literature. I think it's fitting because he's in this existential debate about life and death, and life has this sense of powerlessness. You know, he calls it the slings and throws of uh, outrageous fortune, of the things that we're kind of subjected to, but death has this big unknown black box. And I think that's similar to imaging, right? We, we don't, we don't, we, we're unsettled with the unknown of not imaging. Um, and, uh, and, and yet, I do think when you send patients down that path, I don't think it's benign. I think all the testing we do has associated morbidity, and sometimes it's just emotional morbidity. The weeks leading up to the MRI, the family's in a real panic about this being a brain tumor. And if it is a brain tumor, we need to catch it. But I, 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 I think it's a, uh, a, a challenging um, balance in medicine that we all deal with probably frequently. So and I think maybe it's a more controversial and interesting topic in things like mammograms and, and cancer screening where, you know, these lead to biopsies and incidentalomas. So maybe in strabismus, it's maybe not as controversial. But let me start with a, just go through a couple of cases on this topic. So first case, it's a first year medical student. Um, actually here at the U with sudden onset diplopia with this with all these patients permission I share their cases so never has had double vision prior prior to this and they're really a healthy otherwise um, is, are there any questions what are the questions that come to mind for you as to whether or not to differentiate this from being something that's really concerning or neurologic versus something that's maybe less concerning any thoughts any but, trauma? great question no trauma Anything else? Any other? Family history. So no family history for business. That's a great one. I mean, I think we're seeing so frequently uh, the the genetic piece to a lot of the strabismus that we see in clinic. Monocular, binocular. Uh, what does that mean, doctor? The uh, just kidding. The uh, yeah, great question. And binocular. This medical student just had his anatomy lecture, and actually he was very interested in giving me some of these detailed questions. So good question. <laughs> Uh, it's only he only has it in a particular when he looks a particular direction, which starts which direction? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to the right. Why don't, why don't we jump into the video here? So this is telemedicine at its best. He actually sent this to me before going to the ER since he's he's kind of an acquaintance. So that's where it's at. That's where he's doubles. The. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the whole story is he's actually neighbors with my brother-in-law, and this came up in a conversation. My brother-in-law said, I think this is what Griffin does. So, <laughs> not sure. yeah, so, I'll, so, I'll, so why, don't you, why don't you text him? So that's the video. So, so now, does that answer your question, image or not image? Who wants to, who, who, by raising right hands, who wants to get an MRI on this guy? How about a fat scan first? Oh, Kathleen. The, uh, what, a, what a great thought. So, um, let me, let, me, let, me, let me get to that real quick. So here we go. Uh, you see clearly what, what what's what's this called? What what diagnosis or clinical description would you give this? Especially in right gaze. I know you all just eat, drink, and sleep strabismus, right? It's like the the great topic of ophthalmology. So left inferior oblique overaction, which would look like what diagnosis? Or your left. Fourth nerve palsy, yeah. The, um, so I asked him, well, how long have you been tilting your head? And his response was, I tilt my head. And, uh, and, and uh, Kathleen's recommendation, I said, can I just see your, can I, because he said this came on on Sunday. Not, I've never had it before then, and it's, it came on Sunday, and I can now have, I have double vision all the time. And I said, can I see your name badge that was taken six months ago as a student? Okay, here's our question. 
Hamlet, boy, he looks like he's really in this great existential debate there. So, so I get his name badge from six months ago, and what would you what what, what do you see? It's not a new head tilt. Um, yeah, Bob just said the next thing. So. He's, he's, he's got what we call facial asymmetry or mid-face hypoplasia. So in patients with congenital fourth nerve palsies, their face morphs and absorbs a little bit of the tilt. I'll give you some more dramatic examples here, but look at that one. So if you draw a line between their lateral canthi and the, and the edges of their lips, you can see those two lines are not parallel in these patients of congenital fourth nerve palsy. Another one, uh, here's the most dramatic one I've seen in literature back from 1967. That's from a congenital fourth nerve palsy, all that facial dysmorphism. Um, so, of course, I'm twisting the story here. I didn't get to see him first, but if I saw this patient, I would have not gotten an MRI. I think we've got plenty of data to suggest that this was an acute decompensation of a congenital problem. But he got to the, the ED got him first, and they ruled out a brain tumor and, of course, Everyone's a drug addict until proven otherwise in the ED, and, and he turned out to not be a drug addict. So, so the um, so fat scan photo album topography is what kind of differentiated this as a congenital um, congenital problem. Uh, so case two, another medical student. So th th you should sense a pattern here. We're probably doing something wrong in medical school to cause all this strabismus to come out. <laughs> the um, so. Um, Acute onset esotropia in double vision. I'm, I'm guessing the same, same set of uh, questions. So here we are, image or not image. Are, are there any things that you want to look for? I heard Benedict Cumberbatch played a fabulous Hamlet. That's what they say. Uh, so um, what, what are some of the things you can look for on exam? Is there anything that you could use on exam to help differentiate this from a neurologic Emergency versus a non-emergent non issue. Great question. It is competent. Full abduction in both eyes as well. Anything else on exam you're going to look for? Pupillary constriction. Ooh, expound on why you would look for that. <laughs> Convergent spasm. It's great to have neuro ophthalmologist in the room. The, um, <laughs> uh, anything else? <laughs> Cycloplegic refraction. Yeah, you know, uh, 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 latent hyperope, or you know, yeah. you know, one of our big questions is, is with all esotropia, is there a con an accommodative component here? Um, so let me go through this exam. Some of the things that we saw. So I, I don't have this pictures of this patient, but these were some of the features we saw here. What's what's going on here? Someone shout out what the finding is. So they're in, looking in either side gaze, what do you notice? So, yeah, there's bilateral inferior oblique overaction. Um, is this a bilateral fourth nerve palsy? Probably not, because uh, this is esotropic patient, but they've got this inferior oblique overaction. As we're doing the testing, you cover up one eye and uncover it, and we see the eye has just floated up quite a bit after being occluded. What's that called? DVD. Um, for time's sake, I'll jump ahead with latent nystagmus. Uh, right, the, you occlude one eye, and then you have a nystagmus that comes out, and it's the fast phase beats away from the occluder. Um, so, these are all features of a congenital strabismus complex. So patients who have intraoblique overaction, DVD, late nystagmus, and no stereopsis, they almost definitely had to have this from birth to get all those features. Um, why did this woman acutely decompensate? That's a question for the wellness committee at medical school. But the, uh, um, we see that patients can maybe have some degree of motor fusion, but when they lack, when you, when your eyes are crossed in the first year of life, the ability to be binocular and have sensory fusion is significantly disrupted, and that causes patients to have um, all these phenomena. There's a question that usually kind of ninches, the, or kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? Not, clitches. Thank you. Um, clitches this. 
which is anyone, anyone is, I guess what I'm thinking question, but any thoughts? How could you ask this question, ask a patient about their binocularity and their, in their before this? Because again, this came on on Wednesday, it's Friday. What's that? Sports. Sports, being able to like depth perception questions. Yeah. Any other, any other? 3D movies. I'll be in 3D. 3D movies, those are such a rip off. They're just 2D. <laughs> yeah, that's a great one. They always say, they always say, I, I, you know, it's like the emperor, the, the emperor who has no clothes. It's like, I guess I should be thinking this is normal because everybody else seems to enjoy it, but the movie sure doesn't look 3D to me. Um, it is 3D. Yeah, yeah. I've had patients not tell me that they didn't pass the 3D component of their driver's license test. Oh, interesting. The, um, the one that I thought find is a really high yield is binoc binoculars and microscopes. They, they always have to close one eye because they can't get the two images to fuse together. And uh, she says, I've never been able to use binoculars my whole life. So again, I wouldn't have gotten an MRI on this patient because I think there's enough to, to suggest. And then I have the luxury of the MRI, the ED already got an MRI and it was normal. So. <laughs> So I think that ends that question. So let's do a third case. Uh, shout out, what are your concerns, thoughts on this patient, and, and whether you image or not image? Retro bulbar anesthetic. Yeah, so, you've, you, so they, they, didn't, they didn't get a block for surgery, but that's a great question because sometimes you know, we, we put the block into a, a muscle in, inadvertently and can cause your business. It was good. It was, I mean, it was 2040, 2050, and she's now 2020 in each eye. Variability. What about that droopy eyelid? Ooh, yeah. Look, look, look at that brow. What do you notice about that right brow? I mean, she's, she's really engaging that right brow. So this is pretty significant ptosis. Um, in addition to, you can see by the Cornell light reflex um, and ET. So what's, what's your feeling on this one? Based on what you're seeing so far, who would image by raising hands? Who would get an MRI? And uh, this has been very gradual. Um, and, and who would not image and just say that we do a sleep test, rest test. A rest test. So rest test is negative, or, or, or she, she doesn't have increased, no signs of myasthenia, but a, good, a great question. Um, so let's just show her motility exam here. This is a. Great example of classic floating saccades. Watch the right eye here. It moves much more slowly as, as the left eye darts over, the right eye floats. So what's the diagnosis here? Right sixth. Yeah, right sixth nerve palsy. Ptosis is on the left side. The, yeah, the ptosis wasn't as obvious here as it was in the picture. The, uh, um, so uh, on clinic, I'll kind of repeat the exam, it was pretty consistent right ptosis, yeah. Okay. Um, so that's her MRI. So um, she had a baseball sized meningioma. Um, they got the MRI on a Friday and called her back in and did surgery on Saturday with I mean, that degree of kind of herniation and midline shift. It was amazing that she was so well. Her personality had changed over the course of a year and she just thought it was aging. And uh, anyway, she was, uh, they got this successfully resected and she did great. It was slow growing, but uh, it's really taking a lot of space. You can see it invading the cavernous sinus. And, and, and I think on her, one of the take homes is she had multiple cranial neuropathies. And I, and I think that's, that's, a, that's an, uh, a, a definite reason to image. Um, you can see here's where, where she would probably have the, where her cranial nerves were getting compressed. So um, her uh, surgery, there's a lot of different things you can do for a six nerve palsy. Um, one, one that's um, kind of a newer thought is, because we, we wrestle between resecting and resecting the horizontal muscles versus transposing the superior and inferior rectus over to the lateral rectus so they can help pull the eye or s supply abduction power. And, uh, and, one, and then there's a new, uh, another kind of combination of the two where you transpose just the superior rectus over so we'll put the superior rectus right next to the lateral rectus and then sew the two of them together about eight to 10 millimeters back so that that superior rectus is pulling or a, providing abduction, abduction power. But in most cases, the medial rectus has been contracted because the eye's been esotropic for so long. 
So that also needed to be recessed. And this is her after surgery. What's interesting is you see that she still has limited AV duction as well as limited AV duction a little bit. So unfortunately, we can't give these patients full range of motion, but we can give them hopefully what we call a range of binocular vision where at least they can look a little bit to the left and the right and still have single vision. Um, and and she, did, she did well from that. Okay, one, one other case, um, a seven-year-old with Noonan syndrome. So I see her just as a part of screening. We see a lot of syndrome kids that have a high incidence of um, ophthalmic pathology and associated with the syndrome. And uh, as I'm following her, she's developing this kind of small angle. It's actually, it's meant to be intermittent there at first and then increased to 35 degrees over the course of about six months. So this is not an acute onset. Um, is there anything that you could think of that would make you want to either get an MRI or not get an MRI here? No papilledema. Yeah, that's, uh, you, know, you know, part of my basic exam is always checking for apiduction, papilledema, and then just looking for other cranial neuropathy problems. Ptosis, anisocoria, uh, you know, any um, facial palsy or uh, uh, none of the tingling. She has none of that. So, so I, I thought it was okay to not image and, and get and do a medial rectus recession. She's a little undercorrected, and I'm not panicking because strabismus surgery. I wish it was more precise, but it doesn't always get exactly what we expect. So, but she's fusing it well. And then nine months later, comes back with this. So now she's crossing more than she was even the first time around. And so um, now I think, well, we ought to get an MRI because that's a very unusual evolution. Still has full abduction. Do you have a thought? Full, full abduction. That's going to Still, yeah. still has still full abduction. Yeah. But in yeah, Mr. Got an MRI. <coughs> it, this is tough. I wouldn't have seen this because I'm, I'm, but if you look right here, anyone want to name that diagnosis? Yeah, Bob got it. So. It's a Chiari malformation, and it was considered by the neurosurgeon to be about type one and a half. So there is some kind of lower brainstem compression, and these have been shown in the literature to be associated with uh, a, a concomitant esotropia. So it's, I mean, this is, I, I share this case because I, I, I probably should have gotten the MRI the first time around, and it's, it's not always obvious. You don't always get uh, clear clues as to whether it's an image or not. Um, so she'll get decompression surgery, which has also been shown to, to correct at least partially their esotropia. Um, this is a great study, I think, on trying to help navigate some of these complex decisions. So this was a, a number of cases that they grouped into different etiologies as far as sudden onset esotropia and what it ended up being. So Bob mentioned this, you know, if it's accommodated, meaning you find that they're really moderately to, or highly hyperopic, um, that's a, a, a large percentage of the patients that we see that have this. Um, you know, a decompensated esophoria, again, that fit into that category of it's a, an acute onset of an old problem um, or a, of a chronic issue. So, uh, and there's, we still see a handful of idiopathic causes. Um, this is, of course, number four is the one that we worry about, missing a brain tumor in these kids, and 6% incidence rate maybe that you know, one of the debates we have in medicine is what's, you know, we talk about the, the number needed to treat and maybe there's, with imaging, the number needed to detect. Do I get an MRI on everybody because there's a 6% incidence rate of catching a brain tumor? That's, I don't think anyone would fault you for that. Um, the, uh, but in these cases, so you jump from four down to this bottom point here, these patients all had either papilledema, a really large angle isotropia, or they were older than six, which in peds, yeah, seven-year-old starts getting pretty old to us. So the, um, and my patient that had the Noonan syndrome was seven. So they would also, based on those criteria, probably should have uh, imaged her just based on her older age. Um, but uh, yeah, I think these are uh, not easy cases, but there's a lot of clues and cues you can use to at least try to give you some positive predicted value before you go into getting MRIs as to which, who's likely to have pathology and who's less likely. Um, the, uh, some of the principles I use are, again, looking for those congenital clues I went over. Number two, a neuro ophthalmologist taught me this. It was two strikes and you're out, which is if you see, you know, concomitant strabismus, that's one strike. 
But by itself, that often is um, an isolated phenomena. And for every one case I saw of that Noonan syndrome case where there was a brain tumor, I, I feel like I've seen 30 cases where sudden onset esotropia, they were totally fine. Everything else was actually normal and their uh, normal brain MRI, um, or we did get an MRI and they continued to be fine. Um, and I think the big issue in medicine right now is this big fear of malpractice lawsuits and missing something. And, and I, my, my personal experience is, is that when we partner with the patient and make it a joint decision, they feel like they played a role in the decision enough that it wasn't any one person's fault. And that Noonan syndrome patient, for example, I had talked to her about her, my concerns, whether the image or not the image, and the mom and I both kind of elected not to get the MRI the first time around. And she wasn't at all upset the second time around when we did get the MRI and found that, that syndrome, because I think she felt like I was being completely transparent with my thinking with her. And, and, and of course, not every patient is that uh, kind of maybe kind and forgiving of the things that we do that, uh, or the mistakes that we make. But um, I do find that that is quite protective. P patients typically don't sue because you miss something. They sue because you abandoned them and didn't explain it or didn't communicate clearly. Um, a any thoughts on, on this kind of question or comments? Well, the, uh, Bob? Well, I, I think this is, this is great. I mean, using an, a thoughtful approach to work through things, work with the patient and the family is absolutely what you need to do when you're right on target. This is great. Yeah, thanks. I, th I, mean, I think it's, anyway, we, we in, in, in pediatrics, we have the added, uh, kind of concern or morbidity associated with imaging that they're, they're put under anesthesia. It's a, it's a, it's kind of a big deal. It's a big deal to families and, and you can see parents on ice always, their pupils dilate every time you talk about getting an MRI on their kid. And from that time, that from that moment till the time they get an MRI, they're in panic mode about what the MRI is going to show. And, and so I think that decision should never be taken lightly. And, and that it, that again, it's not always straightforward. Go ahead. I was just going to say, even in adults, the downside of an MRI is a lot bigger than it used to be with the structure of health insurance now where a lot more people have high deductible plans. So you order an, M you order an MRI and someone might be paying a few thousand dollars just out of their pocket to get the MRI. So I think they at least like to be involved with the decision and know why it's being done. Yeah. So Totally agree, Brian. And I, I'm, by raise of hands, who, who here has found an incidental loma that really caused a lot of patient distress on an MRI that was unrelated to the pathology? Yeah, they not, I think it happens all the time. And I think when you find these things, I, I don't know if we're really, so, sometimes it's a serendipitous discovery of a brain tumor that we thankfully caught. Boy, we were lucky that this led, you know, this, this sequence of events happened. But a lot of times it just is something that they've got to worry with and they're already maxed out on their stress. Anyway. You know, the other issue that's come up is similar to your Noonan's patient. The patient who's got cometan esotropia has a Chiari, but without other neurologic findings that would mandate that the Chiari be fixed. I've had the neurosurgeons come back and say, well, straighten the eyes out. I'm not going to decompress that uh, because they didn't think it was enough reason to do it. So that is an issue. and so that if they're being decompressed and it's gonna help, that's great. But it hasn't been a universal uh, you know, thing. Even with the Chiari, you find it and you say, well. Yeah. Bob, <laughs> well, I'm really curious your, your long-term experience with that because I've also, you know, the neurosurgeons and I have talked, you know, look, eye muscle surgery is a way better risk profile. It does, but. And if it's the, if esotropia is an isolated neurologic finding, what I found is those kids ultimately needed decompression in the end. Is right. that what you found out? Yeah, it is. Ultimately, they get decompressed because I think at the very least what we do is we cause them to look at the kids more closely. They're looking for other things that they can relate to it. And so I think bringing that to their attention, most of the, the kids where I've had pushback ultimately have been decompressed. Yeah. And when, were they, when they were decompressed with recurrent esotropia after one eye muscle surgery, uh -huh. did the they straightened result? out, you know, and Jack Walker, who was the you know, kind of uh, um, initial pediatric neurosurgeon in the Intermountain area was convinced that decompressing Chiari's and untethering cords both uh, uh, resulted in straighter eyes in the patients that we jointly followed, you know, through Spina Bifida Clinic. Yeah. Interesting. 
I mean, that, my patient, I think if I would have gotten the MRI the first time around, I would have had that same debate. They said, yeah. too mild, too strabismus surgery, it's a low risk. So in the end, it probably would have changed management because we would have gotten to this point anyway where the surgery came back before we would have done a decompression. But now I think it's pretty clear they need it. But let me, let me turn the rest of the time over to Rachel. Um, oh, this la last point, you know, it's interesting. We, we all take an oath to say, first do no harm. And that can be interpreted either way, right? First, don't miss anything, because that can be harmful. Or don't over test, because that can be harmful. So it's a really interesting dilemma that I think we all struggle with. And I think the more that we collaborate and partner with patients, the better. And we also have to figure out how we're, you know, got to fight the fight against decompensated business and medical students. Probably stressing them out too much. Um, okay, thanks everybody.